Welcome everyone to the second talk of the academic track. Um, uh, my name is Christina Ludwig. I'm a member of the scientific committee this year for the state of the map. Um, I'm uh, working in Heidelberg at the GS Science Research Group at Heidelberg University. Some of you may remember it from two years ago where the state of the map uh, took place. Um, so the next talk um, is titled, What has machine learning ever done for us? It will be given by Peter Mooney. Uh, he's an assistant professor of computer science at Maynooth University in Ireland, where his research lies at the intersection of computer science and geocomputation. He has been actively involved in research related to OpenStreetMap since 2008. He has been a participant in the academic track of State of the Map since it began and is also an author or co-author of several impactful OpenStreetMap publications. So, Peter, go ahead. Hola, bienvenidos a nuestra presentación para State of the Map 2021. Mi nombre es Peter Mooney y en nombre de mi colaborador y colega Edward Calvin le traemos el resultado de nuestra investigación en la Universidad de Minot University. Esta presentación día es sacar la pregunta ¿Qué ha hecho por nosotros aprendizaje automático Machine Learning? Es una referencia accidental de Monty Python. ¿Qué ha hecho por nosotros? aprendizaje automática para nos, la comunidad de OpenStreetMap. Lo que hemos visto y, y para los que tienen interés en computación, el aprendizaje automático es un enfoque clave para la solución de problemas que atiende temas que son atendidos por, de manera manual. El aprendizaje automático parece trabajar bastante bien para atender problemas difíciles de manera manual. Pueden producir una solución. Ha habido mucho interés académico en aprendizaje automático en el pasado década e incluso más allá, incluso teledetección, el lenguaje natural. Pero la pregunta que queremos hacernos esta vez es, en esta presentación es, dado toda la investigación académica realizada en aprendizaje automática, utilizando aprendizaje automático con o para OpenStreetMap, ¿cuáles son las implicaciones, beneficios o, o beneficios o salidas para el proyecto y la comunidad OpenStreetMap? Se ha realizado investigación sobre ¿existe algún beneficio, algún tipo de valor que se pueda conseguir? para la comunidad o el proyecto OpenStreetMap con aprendizaje. Hay muchas aplicaciones de aprendizaje automático y muchas se han utilizado en la, semana, la década pasada para OpenStreetMap. Pero una de las preguntas que quisiéramos hacernos es ¿cuántas de esos enfoques podrían ser adoptados o usados por la comunidad de OpenStreetMap? Sería una pregunta que se podrían hacer que los académicos desarrollen soluciones basadas en investigación, que los enfoques sean utilizados por la comunidad OpenStreetMap. Y también queremos preguntarnos otra pregunta, ¿cuáles son los beneficios e impactos de los esfuerzos de la comunidad de investigación? La comunidad o el proyecto pueden obtenerlo y acceder a los beneficios. Entonces, aquí una vista general de la presentación. Vamos a tener una metodología, cómo se hicieron las cosas, basado en artículos académicos. Tendremos un proceso que 
¿Qué es lo que hicimos? ¿Qué hicimos? Descubrimientos y observaciones, ¿qué aprendimos? ¿En qué podemos trabajar? Después, lo que lleva al puntos finales de discusión, que son los siguientes pasos. ¿Hacia dónde podría dirigirse la investigación? Entonces, comencemos con la metodología. Como dije, llevamos una, una investigación relacionablemente rigurosa. En 2021 utilizamos Google Scholar, Google Académico, para hacer una revisión de qué, qué nos entregaba. Tuvimos que hacer una revisión manual y selección, por ejemplo, que queríamos que se cumplan ciertos criterios, estén cumplidos. Por ejemplo, el artículo tiene que ser relevante a OpenStreetMap, debe contener un componente significativo de aprendizaje automático o enfoques y no queremos incorporar eh, revisión de literatura. Queremos que el artículo esté basado en, en desarrollo, no en la revi una revisión. Tenemos una lista mantenida de los artículos en GitHub. Es una muestra relativamente pequeña, lo reconocemos. No asumimos que es una cobertura de todos los artículos que están disponibles. Existe un cuerpo más grande de artículos disponible que podría crearse si, si hubiera más tiempo y energía que se dedicara. Entonces, entonces, el artículo tiene que tener un componente importante de aprendizaje automático. OpenStreetMap debe ser utilizado de alguna manera, manera significativa como entrenamiento, como el conjunto de datos destino, como parte de la validación o prueba de aprendizaje automático. Tenemos que considerar situaciones donde, donde OpenStreetMap no es la única fuente de datos, que es integrada con otros conjuntos de datos que son usados en, en aprendizaje automático, que pueden ser datos espaciales o no espaciales usados en, en aprendizaje automático. Aquí tenemos una cuenta de repositorio de GitHub donde están el enlace al, en la lista de State of the Map tendrán acceso a este enlace. Aquí está nuestra muestra, nuestro conjunto de muestra. Como les dije, fue sacado de Google Académico. Elegimos 50 artículos. La, tuvimos que quitar 5 porque no tenían contenido OSM. Quizás solamente era usado como, como baba base, solo para mostrar los resultados, ¿no? O simplemente eran revisión de literatura, ¿no? Eso significa que tuvimos que agregar cinco artículos más para completar los 50 artículos que mencionamos. El proceso. Suposiciones del trabajo. Se asume que el tamaño de la muestra es pequeño, pero asumimos, es una opinión personal, que tenemos una buena representación. No existe una sobrerepresentación de ningún grupo en particular. Tenemos una clasificación que hemos hecho que es potencialmente subjetiva y podría incluir algún sesgo. No asumimos que es totalmente imparcial, indestructible. Utilizamos unas clasificaciones para tener algún entendimiento mayor para atender nuestras preguntas y respuestas.
no evaluamos los resultados de los artículos, los in resultados individuales, todo el tema de exactitud, resultados, no es profundizado, se toma cómo están los artículos, eso es para otro momento. No estamos apoyando ni promoviendo ningún enfoque particular. Se hace una validación cruzada de las clasificaciones si es que exista. Descubrimientos y observaciones. Existe un artículo mostrado aquí por John Vargas y sus colegas en 2021, disponible como acceso público. Es una revisión bastante amplia de OpenStreetMap asociado con aprendizaje automático y teledetección. Como el autor sugiere, los autores sugieren dos formas de uso. Otro, una es para mejorar la calidad y la cobertura de OSM utilizando SIC y teledetección. Y el segundo en aplicación es, es el uso de OSM para entrenar modelos para que luego puedan servir aplicaciones. Lo que estamos nosotros es tomando lo que está en rojo, las dos grandes grupos de aplicaciones. Consideramos esas dos grandes grupos de aplicaciones. Entonces, encontramos que de los 50 artículos tratamos de asignar a las dos grandes grupos de aplicaciones. Te encontramos 23 artículos que entendían la primer grupo, mejorar la cobertura y calidad de OSM con aprendizajes automáticos, mientras que 31 utilizaban datos existentes para entrenar aplicaciones de aprendizaje automático. Dos artículos atendían ambos aplicaciones, tanto manejaba uno y otro grupo de aplicaciones. Aquí tenemos los dos artículos que seguían los dos criterios. Aquí tenemos. Puede ver que ya desde el título se hace mención de mejorar la cobertura o calidad de OSM, pero también, también son utilizados para entrenamiento de aprendizaje automático para servir alguna aplicación. Y esa aplicación puede ser simple, simplemente un tema de calidad de... En la criterio de cobertura y calidad de OSM, los 23 artículos que se mencionaron, que tratan de mejorar la cobertura y calidad, hicimos nuestra propia clasificación qué tipo de cobertura y calidad se estaba haciendo. Por ejemplo, teníamos patrones de contribución en tres artículos, anotaciones, calidad, geometría y problemas topológicos. Estas clases no son necesariamente excluyentes entre ellas. Puede haber sobre, sobreposición, sobre, hay muchas maneras de ordenar estas clases. La clase anotación, que es etiquetado, era la más popular con 14 artículos. De los 23, 14 eran dedicados a etiquetado de, de datos. Y esa era la manera como mejoraba OSM. Ahora, en el otro gran grupo para entrenamiento y aplicaciones de aprendizaje automático, también utilizamos nuestra propia clasificación, ya que no existía propiamente. Tomamos cinco clases, transportación y navegación, 
utilizando como entrenamiento. Tenemos como conjunto de datos de entrenamiento, socioeconómicos, análisis de imágenes y otras categorías que no caían en las anteriores clases. Y hay algunos, unas aplicaciones interesantes, por ejemplo, el enrutamiento de vehículos eléctricos, entrenamiento para crear, para crear bloques de calles, para áreas de construidas, como indicadores socioeconómicos, en el análisis de imagen utilizando etiquetar imágenes, por ejemplo, escuelas. Aquí hemos pasado nuestra clasificación. En, tenemos, he trabajado con el 2019 con mis colegas Greenberger y otros. En otra State of the Map publicamos en el, en el componente académico de, del 2019 el enlace está abajo. Nos preguntamos si podíamos conectar el mapa, cómo se podía explorar las interacciones entre las comunidades académicas y de mapeo de OpenStreetMap. Y había una clasificación y hemos tomado esa clasificación de entonces en el estudio actual. Se puede estimar cuál es la comprensión de los autores. Reconocemos que los artículos algunas veces están reducidos, con, no pueden profundizar en las conexiones, por ejemplo, con los datos. Utilizamos las cinco clases. Si, se, si en los artículos considerados se toma en cuenta OSM como fuente de datos, como fuente de datos con contribuyentes, como producto de datos sociales, o no existe ningún entendimiento. Entonces, esto es lo que encontramos. De los 50 artículos, 25 reconocían OSM como fuente de datos. Eso es algo interesante, no hay duda. Pero al mismo tiempo, otros 25 artículos no tenían ningún entendimiento o percepción de OSM, ninguna consideración. Puede haber eh, razones, pero no, no había un reconocimiento claro de, de OSM en esos 25 artículos. Si solo miramos el, los enfoques de aprendizaje automático, existe una gran variación de técnicas. El, el enfoque de este estudio actual no es criticar, sino simplemente aquí listar qué se ha utilizado de, de aprendizaje. Tenemos Random Forest eh, con aprendizaje automático de conjunto, Ensemble, muy popular para análisis de imágenes, las eh, redes neuronales convolucionales. Tenemos agrupamiento, clustering, supervisado, no supervisado, otros enfoques como boosting y para lenguaje natural LDA. Aquí tenemos en la diapositiva un, un ejemplo de cómo un clasificador de aprendizaje automático podría ser usado para la notación de objetos. Una de las últimas preguntas era, ¿cualquiera de esos enfoques podría ser replicado en otras áreas de OSM? ¿Podría aprovechar la comunidad? Y utilizamos este, un, una representación de semáforos rojo para los que son muy difícil replicar. Ocho artículos, naranja, 29 y verde cuando el artículo definía como prioridad y era posible esa replicación. Aquí tenemos dos excelentes ejemplos de los eh, verdes eh, replicables. Ahí era prioridad. 
siguientes pasos. Existe una gran diversidad, aún incluso en esa muestra pequeña que tomamos. Hay, una, hay algunos artículos que mencionan la calidad de los artículos, donde el aprendizaje automático podría ayudar, pero sin indicar claramente cómo. Tenemos oportunidades de aprendizaje. Todavía queda pendiente de cómo podría hacer esa conexión. Podrían estar ocultos por falta de entendimiento mayor. ¿Cómo podría beneficiarse la comunidad? Entonces, vamos a nuestra pregunta final. ¿Qué ha hecho aprendizaje automático por nosotros? Es estimar el valor que OSM da. Es enorme el valor que ha proporcionado, proporcionado OSM a aprendizaje automático. Muchos de los enfoques podrían darse muy bien para implementación en OSM. Por ejemplo, la sugerencia de etiquetas, corrección de etiquetas, eso sería muy fácil, muy, muy, muy fácil, muy, muy accesible. Finalmente, falta entender cómo ese conocimiento se podría integrar. Resulta difícil todavía cómo el conocimiento de aprendizaje automático se podría contribuir efectivamente a la base de datos y a la comunidad OSM. Como hablamos en nuestro artículo, Greenberg, es un asunto en curso, está todavía en investigación de cómo hacer esa conexión, conexión entre las dos comunidades. Gracias por ver y espero que le haya sido útil este video. Espero que disfruten de la conferencia. Por favor, consulten nuestro artículo. Gracias. Okay, so first of all, um, Peter, thank you for this talk. It's a very interesting talk. Um, as a reminder, yeah, you can, um, for the audience, you can um, post questions about the talk in the questions tab next to um, the screen or also in the chat. Um, I will keep an eye on it. In the meantime, okay, there's a question already. Um, Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, yes. we can hear you as well. So the first question from uh, the audience is the lack of understanding or connection with the OSM community exists way before like diversity research, for example. What, uh, what to do about this? Okay, so I think we started with the difficult question first. Uh, we, 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 uh, including uh, many of us here in the academic track, we had a paper about this a couple of years ago to see how uh, the academic community and the OSM community could uh, interact better together and uh, what, would, what would be the bridge that's required to build between both communities. And I suppose we haven't quite uh, made progress on, on that front in figuring out uh, how we bring both communities uh, closer together. Something that uh, I think is a major, there's a couple of major points that, that I think we can bring forward is uh, continuing academic track uh, events like these that, that uh, ensure that academics have a platform to share their work with the Open Street, Street Map community and to interact uh, directly with them. The second is, as we pointed back to the slides on uh, reproducibility and replicability, that approaches developed by academics are possible to be reproduced and replicated by those outside academia, because sometimes uh, academics have access to data sources and APIs and tools which may not be openly available outside of academia or funded research. So I think that's another uh, important barrier that needs to be considered if you were building OpenStreetMap uh, research to consider how to be more inclusive in terms of the tools 
and data sets. So I suppose I, I don't have a, a clear answer on, on how to join the two communities, but I, I do think the, the answer probably lies in a combination of the, the factors that I've, I've just explained. But again, uh, it's, it's a multifaceted uh, solution that's required. Thank you for this answer. Yeah, it's a, it's a work in progress, that, but that's um, why we're here. Uh, so there's a second question. Um, were there any examples of local communities using machine learning approaches to map their own countries? Or were the papers mostly theoretical or about remote contributions? That, that's a great question. And in the small sample we had, we didn't see specific examples of that. So I certainly uh, don't claim to say that there are no examples existing. The majority, however, were considering uh, remote contributions or indeed uh, looking at the contributions of communities in, in a remote type of way. So uh, it's, it's, it's very possible that there are approaches documented out there in, in other literature that just escaped our, our net with such a, a quite a small sample. Uh, but it was mostly theoretical remote approaches that we encountered in, in our sample. Thank you. Um, so there are no more questions from the audience right now. So I will go ahead with some questions um, from um, our academic comedy. And in the meantime, yeah, you can post follow-up questions in, in the panel. Uh, so one question I had from the selection um, of the papers, did you also um, consider uh, like the, the number of citations or whether those papers were journal papers or conference papers, or did this the selection criteria change maybe in the course of the, of the study? Uh, so, when when we just do a search for machine learning and OpenStreetMap, you 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 retrieve a, a lot of results. But when you start filtering down, you realize that maybe uh, the paper is not at all about machine learning, or it's maybe a machine learning uh, application or approach that just uses maybe an OpenStreetMap base map or something. So we didn't try to be too prescriptive about whether the paper itself was a conference proceedings, was a, a journal paper, etc. We just simply, uh, as I explained, took the first 50 results that, that were returned and screened them carefully so that they did have what we believed was, was a, uh, enough content in terms of machine learning and OpenStreetMap combined to be considered. Uh, I should have actually done that and, and checked the, you know, the classifications, how many were each. I, I'd, I'd imagine it, it was probably uh, the majority were, were journal-based articles, but there were certainly uh, you know, more, than, more than 20 out of 50 were journal articles. So and the remainder a mixture of of different type of of conference uh, proceedings. So that's certainly a great suggestion that we could we could uh, look at in terms of you know the citation rates, the the paper type itself for for future work. But we we, we felt that uh, in what results we were looking at coming back from from Google Scholar. We, we did have to filter to make sure that we were getting a paper that was worthwhile in terms of actually uh, reading and including in our uh, small survey. Thank you. So there are three more questions from the audience. Um, I will start with the first one. How many papers were advocating for machine learning approaches related to human assistance in mapping rather than automated production of data? Uh, I don't have the numbers. Uh, I will be... Uh, the GitHub repository will be populated this evening and it'll be available through the academic track proceedings. I, I don't have a number on that. Uh, there, certainly, there certainly was a, a couple of examples where human assistance was included in, in helping the machine learning approach in terms of training and in terms of you know, building the, the knowledge data set for the machine learning approach. But there was, I suppose, uh, probably a, a slight 
direction towards this automatic uh, production of data and maybe more than the production of data but the suggestion of additional tags or uh, suggestion of, of changes to geometry or maybe uh, issues around topology and and things like that so uh, there were there were certainly papers around using human assistance but they were there was quite few of them thank you so the next question um, is my thesis is that there's also a lack of understanding to fully leverage the OSM data due to using tools as is and OSM tags by missing out alternate OSM tags. Do you agree? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I quite understand the connection of the question to the, the presentation, but I in our reading of the papers that dealt with with annotation and and tagging uh, in OpenStreetMap, there certainly was an effort uh, on the the behalf of the researchers to look at the OSM wiki, to look at map features, uh, tag info tools like this, to uh, try and understand properly and deeply what the tags actually meant, what they actually. Uh, could be interpreted as and how they were used. So the the lack of understanding. I'm 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 not sh I'm not sure if I can give a a full answer to that. There, I I, I do believe that in the work we 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 looked at, I I do believe there was an effort made by the authors to try and understand uh, tagging. Uh, the, sch the schema, et cetera, as best they could. And they did make an effort to uh, to do it rather than just uh, taking the, you know, downloading some data and simply making interpretations about the tagging rules or, or structures or guidance themselves. Thank you for this answer. So the next question is also a bit about the guest transferability of those machine learning models. Like, will the machine learning dif differ uh, in each country? Because as we know, every country has different characteristics, for example, to determine the highway classification. Did you find anything about this in your study? Uh, not specifically, but what we did find was that some many of the approaches actually uh, did localize themselves to a specific country or region. So we, we didn't we didn't find very many examples that, for example, looked at all of Europe or several countries uh, together. So what we what we seen was if there was a, a machine learning approach applied to OpenStreetMap data related to highways, for example, it was often localized to a specific country, city, or a combination of those. So that would probably have uh, managed to avoid some of those problems around uh, different countries having different classifications. The other approach was that this would be somehow taken care of uh, by the research approach in, in actually creating the training data set so that the authors would would try and figure out some kind of a way to uh, solve this problem if there was classification uh, if there was if it wasn't possible to synchronize the classification or somehow map them to each other some type of a, an approach would be used to uh, overcome this to allow the training set uh, data set be developed but I think the my short answer to that would be that it, most of the applications were very specifically based on a specific region. So maybe some of those problems were just avoided rather than solved. Do you maybe think like as a follow-up to this question that that might also be a reason why some of those developed methods to um, and solve the issues um, are not really taken into like are not really implemented on a larger scale for the whole OSM community that like those approaches that are, were developed are maybe not tested for different regions or larger regions yeah that's a that's a very good suggestion uh, and certainly you, you, I cannot argue with it I, I think 
uh, from from what we've seen just in this small subset is that uh, there is a huge amount of work required to set up and tune and parameterize machine learning approaches. And of course, included in this is the is the building of your training data set uh, right off before we start to do any validation or testing. So I, I suppose uh, it's it's probably a, an opportunity that after this initial work is done of of getting a successful or a reasonably effective machine learning approach up and running, then the next stage would be to fine tune it with those specific, you know, regional uh, regional specifications or 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 issues which are specific to a certain city or, or, or country. But I, I think uh, so sometimes this information may just not be documented on the on the paper that we are reading, whereas there may have been some thought around around this these type of problems actually may have taken a lot of time to think about it before the, the training data sets or data set was actually created. So uh, again, I, I think uh, uh, more of an opportunity to to explain the, the process in greater detail w would help, of course, uh, for us all to understand then what kind of assumptions or, or, or those type of understandings are included in the work. Thank you. So there's one more question. Um, what machine learning frameworks were mostly most commonly used in the papers you looked at? Uh, so I, I think PyTorch was very popular, uh, TensorFlow and uh, Python-based machine learning was was very, very popular. Uh, so we did we didn't count uh, we didn't count the approaches because not, not every paper clearly stated the the approach they were using we've seen some approaches using using grass we've seen some uh, I suppose home cooked approaches where there's lots of different uh, frameworks feeding into each other but certainly just off the the top of my head uh, the the obvious candidates tensorflow uh, PyTorch and Python Python and R based machine learning was by far the most popular. Thank you for that. Um, so we still have maybe three minutes. Um, so last chance to post questions. Um, in the meantime, maybe one more question um, to maybe like improve maybe that the, the the papers or the researchers are maybe more targeted towards like the issues that also maybe the OSM community is facing. Can you think of ways how the OSM community could maybe get more into contact um with the the research or give feedback to the research so like um that we uh, that those, those targets from the research and from the osm community are more aligned yeah i think this probably goes back to our the opening question after my talk and uh i i, I still think it goes uh deeply into uh, research, including people like myself and, and all of us here from the academic track in making a bigger effort to ensure open access to our, our work, both the data, our papers, uh, our software, and that will in, in turn then make our work more reproducible, more reusable uh, by others, not just the, the, the not just the OpenStreetMap community, by, by anyone who's interested in this. Uh, I think forums like this are a very important way of, of linking the two communities. Maybe there are opportunities for more of these type of meetings, maybe at a more regional basis over the, the course of a year between state of the maps. So at a, at a, a continental uh, state of the map, for example, or a, a, a regional or national one. And I think, uh, I think there's a great opportunity here for the OpenStreetMap community to say, we have some very interesting problems here that we think would be useful for machine learning. And there is no better uh, specification of a problem than the, than, than the OpenStreetMap community telling us that this is the problem we have, this is our knowledge around that problem, but we're looking for a solution. And I think that would be a great a great way to work 
co-creating a, a, a solution to a problem or problems. So I think uh, I would be excited about the opp opportunities to look at problems which are suggested from the OpenStreetMap community rather than the top-down approach of academics picking what they see as potential problems or issues and trying to solve them. So uh, it probably goes back to our paper from a couple of years ago here in the academic track and maybe the first answer that I gave. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but I think a lot of progress has been made over the last four years. And, uh, you know, we look forward very positively for more interactions in the future. Great, thank you very much. I think there was a very good final words. There's still one question, but unfortunately we don't really have time anymore because we need to then prepare for the next talk. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, afterwards, you are still able to ask questions to Peter in the post-talk chat room, I suppose. So maybe uh, we can move the awesome data quality question um, there. Um, Again, thank you very much. Then um, the next talk um, will start in five minutes. Um, it will also be, of course, a very interesting topic and we'll be happy to see you or hear you there as well. See you then. <laughs>